Welcome back. Shalom, shalom. We are picking up from before Thanksgiving. It seems like an eternity ago, but it really wasn't. <laughs> uh, we will be picking up in Genesis 14. We'll pick up uh, starting with the theme of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, because we want to be able to have our, our complete thought in there. And I failed to look at what verse. Okay, we'll probably pick up about verse 17, just so, so that you can set up. But the last time that we were on, we had a couple of questions raised, and when I said I was going to put an addendum on the end of the last teaching, and unfortunately, I never got around to that, but I'm going to answer it up front here. So anyone who's watching consecutively, here's your answer. Uh, the question that had been raised is how it was phrased in Hebrew that gave us the idea that Moshe, Moses, is the author given credit for writing the first five books, but we know he took compilations of genealogy records from others along the way that he, we believe, and either way is fine. Either way you want to believe, either that God told Moshe everything so that he had those genealogies right, or God told each individual, you know, as they were writing Satchit, it was kept perfectly, and that is what was passed down, that Moshe took, compiled, and added so much more of his own that God gave him to give, that that's why he gets credit. He's the final compiler and personal author of these scriptures also. Uh, when I taught the introduction to Genesis, I went over this, and so just in brevity, what we're looking at is that the Hebrew will say, Sefer Toldot Adam. Sefer Toldot Moshe. What that means is Sefer is, um, I, have to get, I have to think it through the right way, uh, Sefer is the scribe that's writing the book. Okay, when we say Toldot, it's the genealogies. So when you say the, the book that's being written of the genealogies by Adam, the book that's being written of the genealogies by Moshe. That gives us the idea that they compiled that part. They kept those records. The same way you keep your family tree today and you pass that down to someone in your family who you hope will keep adding to it and it goes on and on. And especially with all the DNA research people can do nowadays, they go back in those generations and they're trying to make those connections. But if a family kept records, how much easier it would be, and also accurate. You would know, well, I've got this in my great-great-grandmother's handwriting. So I do believe, because of the way the Hebrew is written, it's most likely that God saw to it that Adam compiled what God wanted Adam to compile. Maybe it was more than just the genealogical records. Maybe he, he did the part of his life with Eve. But we know that Moshe oversaw all of it, and God saw to it when it was completed by Moshe, it was without error. How do we know that means we have no error today? Because you'll hear those naysayers, oh, well, all you've got is translations. Well, the way we know the accuracy is by looking at the Hebrew transcripts that we do have, or the ancient Aramaic, or Akkadian, and other Babylonian, other that we have. And what I can tell you is any, and we have a lot of fragments, but we have the whole book of Isaiah, anything that we have, shows the accuracy of today. When you get a translation that is very close to the original language, it is very accurate. This, the um, scroll, which it really was, of Isaiah, that's in the um, shrine of the book in Jerusalem. You walk all around it. They've done the whole thing in the shape of a scroll in the jar that the scroll was, was found in. They said that that dates way back into the same time. This is about the time of Yeshua Jesus. And the Isaiah we have today, there are four minor differences. A minor difference is a dot or a comma. It's not a period. It's not even as much as, you know, an end of sentence or beginning. It's something so minute. It's like you're writing and you forgot to dot your I. You know, that's, that's it. That's the only difference. So that shows us that accuracy. So overall, whether Moshe wrote entirely or whether he compiled from some and also wrote, I'm going to tell you the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was overseeing. And it was being breathed into one or more and as we continue on, we know more. We know Joshua is going to be important in writing his 
book, and we go all the way down to Sha'ol Paul writing 13 books in our Brit Hadashah, our New Covenant, they are without error. We can trust them. If anyone can find an error in the Bible, they need to speak up, and we will all say, oh, okay, then we can't trust any of it, because it's either 100% accurate, or who gets to say what is and what isn't. I don't want what man says, I want what God says, and he alone. But I can and I do stake my entire life and my future on the Word of God, believing it to be inerrant. Does that mean we understand every word? No. But anything that's pertinent to our salvation and to our way of living, oh, yes, we do understand. <laughs> that does not take anything more than, than what is there. And then the Holy Spirit reveals to us so much more. So in the long and the short that's why I believe there was some compilation done because of the Hebrew phrasing, but it does not have to be that I've got that 100% right. All I will tell you is the author of your Bible is the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, when you say, is it safer? Say safer. S-A-V-E? No, it's in, in our English, they actually spell it S-E-F-E-R. And I'm glad you said that because we're going to get a very closely related word today that I got all excited over. That's coming. But that S doesn't mean the same. I mean, he saved all this stuff. No, safer means like today, the rabbi that I have connection with in Israel, when Brenda and I were in Israel and her daughter Brianna, his safer, his scribe who writes the scriptures, and that's what a safer is, is it's the writings. Okay, and the person is called a safer nowadays, but back here, yeah, it's the writings. Um, you could say the book, you could say the writings, but safer, that's what it means. It's the scribe that's writing, and he took our names and wrote them in beautiful Hebrew, gave them to us on a little slip of paper. And when I came home on that trip, that had to be my number one souvenir, <laughs> just because it's precious to me. So anyway, um, but there are the safer has that responsibility. And if you don't know, and I'm not ready on the detail because I don't remember it all, but there is extreme um, criteria when a safer is writing the scriptures. If a mistake is made in the past when they could not separate parts of their parchment, the whole entire was thrown out. They would count from beginning to end. They knew what the middle word was to be. And when they counted, if they didn't come to that middle word, it was all thrown out. I mean, we are talking no room for errors. You couldn't erase. You couldn't scratch out. They, they would um, go into prayer. They would go into a formal cleansing of their bodies before they ever picked up the quill that was only used to write these scriptures. And it, at a certain point before it could wear, it was thrown out and a new one brought in. So there was no, like your pen runs out of ink. You won't find that in any Hebrew scripts because they didn't give it a chance. I could go on and on the levels that they went to to see to it that it was copied 100% accurately. That's why we can say, we've got it. We've got it. No worries. We've got it. Anything that isn't that 100% does not matter. So did I answer the question? I think I did. I'm sorry. All of a sudden, it's, yeah. what was the question? Okay. <laughs> question number two that was asked, and I will... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Rhonda. Un unmute yourself. Wait. Roger's working on it, too. <laughs> I, I just... This thought just came to me just now that <laughs> um, what we can say about the Holy Bible, um, the Old Testament, New Testament, is this aspect of the word being written that doesn't take place in other religions. It's like they might have a solo author, but that type of critique and, and exactness is not taking place in these other writings of these other religions. Absolutely. So that just, and that just came to me. Very good point, yes. And we've got over 40 authors, over 1,500 years, over all kinds of walks of life, and they all agree Try putting 40 people in one room and show them one, one occurrence. The tests have been done. They've had a person run through the room, and then they'll ask the people, what was the person wearing? What was the color of their hair? 
you know, different, what shoes do they have on their feet? And they'll get a ton of answers. <laughs> and everybody was right there. But God saw to it, that continuity. And God told us in Second Timothy, when Second Timothy was wrote, written, pardon me, you have to realize not all of the Brit Hadashah was, but it said at that point, all scripture is written, it is given authority. Okay. Inspired. Thank you. All scripture is inspired by God. I'm still not doing it right. Look up 2 Timothy 3.16. It will tell you. And because that was put into the word of God, even though not all the word of God was written at that point, by the time that it is sealed, our bearer sheet to our revelation, that means all scripture, all of it is inspired, inerrant, profitable for correction, able to reprove. There we go. I got it out. A little bit in my words, but see, that's what I'm saying. They didn't get to do what I just did. <laughs> they had it exactly. And that's an amazing feat. And it could only be done because it really is one author. And that's why it could be done that way. Total control over them in that way. And and wow, what a, a opportunity they had to serve the Lord. What a job. Wow. And the printing is beautiful. Okay, second question I was asked um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, however long this has been. We will deal with this in more detail when we get to Genesis 19, I think it is. Um, we're talking about Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the, they're no longer, and Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. And I was asked, why salt? Salt's good. Salt preserves. Why salt? Um, and I don't have a definitive answer yet, but I have some thoughts for you. One brought out how salt was... Do you want to ask your question before I answer? Go ahead. Uh, well, you said for if we wanted to find out to read such, such, and I did. Okay. So they said they had salt pits. Okay. <clears throat> and so are they saying that she fell in a salt pit or... I don't know. Okay. But You'll find things aren't real clear because they're guessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, and there's also, and this is where I didn't have time because I'm not a scientist, but in the fire and brimstone, it, there is thought that there was salt in that and that she was covered. Like I'll say when we have a fire and the ashes fall on your house too, like that, that some are saying that's what it, it was, why she was a pillar of salt as it was referring to the what was being poured out, the fire and brimstone, as scripture calls it, on the cities, oh. that it also came on her. It definitely, and that's where I'll go with us when we're on that, that chapter, um, definitely the Hebrew isn't that she glanced back, that she heard a big noise and went, oh, and got in trouble for it. No, it was a longing. She was turning back where her heart was. She was not coming out, and she didn't want to come out. That was her heart. Um, it's a metaphor, they say, for a no man's land that it's turned into a wasteland. And that's what, you know, the area became. So she became waste. But again, then some will say, but salt's good. They even salted babies, newborn babies, because they saw it as a preservative. So there were many reasons for using salt. We know that when salt loses its savor, it was good for nothing but to throw it on the ground to keep the ground from being slippery for the horse's hoofs, that the salt helped give them traction. But the idea, it no, no worth except trample it underfoot. People weren't going up to this pillar of salt and saying, oh, I've got my table salt now and let's go. No, it wasn't a value. Um, there was salt used in the sacrifices Run with that in your mind and see if you come up with something. Like I said, by the time we get to this, I'll have been able to study it a bit more and see if I can be more conclusive myself. But I liked this one way of putting it. It said, rather than allow her to preserve the cherished memory of Sodom, which she would have done because her heart was with it. So uh, rather than allowing her to preserve that where they were sent in a new place, God preserved her. <laughs> as a pillar of salt. Uh, okay, that's one way to put it. But um, it definitely in some way was showing that the value of her heart was turned back. Because she was from there because a lot was not married when he was traveling. Right, right. So she came here. from S Sodom, yes. And they call her, today it has a different meaning, but it comes from there. They call her a sodomite. And it definitely does mean one who is, you know, not walking with God and living a righteous life. And that was definitely 
um, a picture of her. But then again, they'll say, why salt? Why not pepper? Why not something else? You know, why salt? And I, again, I don't have the complete. I will also say, though, it does say she became a pillar of salt and a pillar there were garrisons, there were guards that were like a, a deputy that was to oversee something. And they said it's almost like she was being, you know, representing that's, you know, that's what this is. It's worthless. And, you know, put a guard up here and don't go in that direction. So a lot of different thoughts. <clears throat> if you come up with something you like, share it with me, share it with the class. But that's at this point until I can do more. That's what I'm going to say. Okay, but then that's how Conde always said, salt and light, we're salt and light, because we are strong and we pass on, we don't quit right away, we just keep Right, going and, going. and salt was good. It had good purposes and were to be good bringing the light to the world. So yes, salt, it can be a definitely, and even our bodies need a certain amount of salt. We're made that way, so... Um, so yes. Because it's a chemical, and chemicals come from <clears throat> the ground. Yes. From the earth. Yes, and that's all we're made up of. At one point in time, I'm going to say in my teens, our chemicals were worth about 75 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I might give you a dollar for inflation today. <laughs> Anybody got a dollar? <laughs> okay, the last question before we get into today's study was, when did Jerusalem start being called Jerusalem? Aha, that store is other. Yes, you did ask. And I warned you, I may not be able to come out with 100% authority on, you know, this is it, here it is. I knew that that was in the back of my mind, and I started a lengthy search into it again. And um, really, we know at this time that the word Salem seems to be at the same time in our Hebrew and in the ancient Hebrew, which we're looking at at this time, it seems to be off the same root as Shalom, that peace that, um, you know, Shalom means peace, but it means completeness and wholeness. And when you have it with the Yeru in the Hebrew, what you're saying is a foundation of peace or a possession of peace. <coughs> And that they believe that the name, they see an ancient Egyptian, which I'm, I'm not going to put as much value over there because that's not our Bible, but an ancient Egyptian at even 2300 BC, which is a little before this time, that it was called, and I didn't, this is what I should have printed out, it's upstairs on my computer screen, something close to U-R-U-S-H-A-L-I-M, that that was the name Jerusalem, and as language morphs, and as we don't, like in, in Hebrew, there's no J, so you don't say Jerusalem, you say Yerushalayim, that with those differences in languages, they're saying Egypt was calling that place Jerusalem already at 2300 about BC. Um, again, because I was Egyptian and not Hebrew, I don't know. Someone made a big point and said, well, you can't get from Shalom to Yerushalayim. That, that, no, you can't. I beg to differ. We do that all the time. It may not be polite, but we'll say instead of San Francisco, we'll say San Fran. Or we'll call it Frisco, which used to be safe and I understand now is bad. San Bernardino. I used to hear San Berdu. <clears throat> We all shorten things at times, so I don't argue as that one did who said you can't, it wouldn't have had a shortened name like Salem. I'm not, I, I disagree with that. And I do believe it was to be a representation of the peace, the shalom that you possess in Yeshua, in the Lord. That this one who is king of Salem is telling you he is king of peace. Now, we're going to go into that, was he actually, or was he representing? And we'll go into that as we get back into our teaching for today. So the best I can do until I can come up with something that is a source I trust, and they give me concrete instead of their ideas, is somewhere probably around this time, it became known more as Yerushalayim than just Salem, Shalom which both Salem and Shalom, the S-H and the S alone, seem to be interchangeable in the, the language um, the writings that they have. I know today in Hebrew, 
the letter looks the same. It's, it's that W-like letter. You know, the letter that I've shown you stands for God. And the only way you know whether it's a sound or a sh sound is a dot above one of those three branches. If it's on one side, it's a sound. And if it's on the other side, it's a sh sound. So it's very easy to see because they didn't have those markings in the ancient scripts that they would know how to pronounce from what they were being taught, what was being passed down to them. They would know whether it was Salem or Shalom, and it could be that as teaching wasn't held as close, that it really kind of both were used. Maybe, like we'll say, tomato and tomato, potato and potato, pecan and pecan. I remember a girlfriend of mine coming from the East, and she called me, Aunt, Rochelle, yeah, Aunt Rochelle to my little niece who looked at her like, who are you talking about? And I had to start laughing and say, tell her you're telling her about Annie Shell. <laughs> now, Auntie Shell and Aunt Rochelle were one and the same. But depending on where you came from in the country, depending on what you were saying. And I tend to think that's what we're looking at, that the pronunciation was a bit different depending on where they were coming from. But I think, I think they must have been, they at least came off of the same root. And how it became known more as Yerushalayim, meaning foundation of or possession of peace, I think could have been in people's understanding as time moved on. Avram, what did he know about this one that he stood before? He knew enough that he pays tithe and offering unto him. He knew something we don't have recorded in Scripture. Because he didn't say, hey, who are you? He responded to who he was. We're given by his name and the meaning in Hebrew, an idea of his identity, and then by the actions, we can come to one of two conclusions. And as I told you the last time I taught, I'm not here to tell you that we can know for a fact is 100% sure it's this and not this. There's good evidence on both sides. So I'm going to present both sides and the Holy Spirit can lead you into which way you feel is the more accurate. Both are good, neither are bad, neither matter for salvation or for your faith. So it's okay. You know, where it matters, God's clear. So clear, a little child can tell you. So all that said, let's start looking at Mel Melchizedek. And I say that because I want you to begin to hear it in the Hebrew to get the pronunciation. Um, what has, uh, because I want you to know the Hebrew words and their meaning. But what we're looking at through verse 16 in um, chapter 14 is we're looking at the war. There were four kings against five kings. And we know that Avram went after them with, with the three that sided with him. They were the four. They went after the five who had taken captive Lot and his belongings along with the others, taking them out of the land where they were living and into captivity. And when Avram was made aware of it, he asked three others to join him. They stood allied with him. They went after them. And in the power of our God, he brings Lot back. He's coming back from the victory. But remember, I told you, they went all the way up north. They went up past what is the area known for, for the tribe of Dan later. They went up into the area of Syria. They went way up north. They had done a lot of traveling, a lot of battle. They're coming back victorious, but they're coming back tired also. You're going to be worn out. Eliyahu, Elijah, fights the prophets of Baal. He's on the mountaintop, but the next day he's crashing physically. You're worn out. So that's where we're picking up that he comes to the Valley of the Kings. Um, they call it the Valley of uh, Shava. Um, the King's Valley in verse 17. So I guess let me read that. Then after his return from the, de the, the okay, excuse me, let's try to use our English, Rochelle. <laughs> after his return from the slaughtering of Kedorla Amor, or after the, um, I'm looking at both, after the defeat, the kings who were with him, with Ophram, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the Valley of Shava, that is the King's Valley. King of Sodom, that's his area. They're coming through. They've had this great victory, and someone shows up. Let's just jump into that. Verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, I'll say it in our English, brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest of God Most High. Okay, we've got to stop, and we've got to think 
we're being introduced to a lot in this verse. So those of us who have studied names of God and this is familiar, go back and be with, with us here. This is the first time Avram's heard that name, at least to our knowledge. We're being introduced to, to all of these names, to Malachi Zedek. We're being introduced to God Most High. In our Hebrew, that's El Elyon. Okay, so at this point, the Hebrew for Melchi Zedek. Melchi is uh, my, I'm sorry, I have to think the two through because Zedek, yeah, Zedek is righteous. Melchi, Melech, you'll hear me say Melch David, King David. Melchi is my king. The one that's got the, the I sound there is personalized. My king is righteous or my king of righteousness is what this name means so it was it could have been just a title of the ancient kings of salem uh, and it could have been derived from an ancient people who lived righteously but if so i'm going to say then somehow it was connected to the godly line if that's true i'm not sure if that's true or not but our hebrew definitely is true that this one who is being introduced to us by his name is telling us my king is righteous. Now, Melchizedek was a king ruler in Salem because he's told we're told that he was king of Salem. So if this is Jerusalem, that was his area before we're, we know that it's to be called Jerusalem. He's the king over it. And remember, king doesn't mean that you've got a whole kingdom and palace and all of that. It's like a mayor. It's, he can be king of the city. It can be a king of several cities that have come together, that are allied together. So it fits for him to be called a king, but it definitely does mean he's head. He's chief. He's, you know, he's top dog here. I'll put it in that vernacular. But he's also a priest, Notice that if we skip the part of what he brought out for a moment, now he was a priest of God Most High. This is unique because as we're going to go down and go through our 12 tribes and we're going to develop the tabernacle and the temple, we're going to see that the kings came from the tribe of Judah and the priests came from the Levitical tribe, the tribe of Levi. They're, they're in Aharon's family to be the high priests, Cohen, Cohen Gadal, the great high priest. So we have two different families. We have two different rulings usually. In this one, we're seeing the two put together. And if you have been taught in scripture and you know scripture, your mind saying, I know somebody else. I know one other who is told to us to be king and priest. He's also judge. There's only one who's ever been all three roles, and that is the one who represents God Most High, the one who is God Most High, the one that we call Yeshua Jesus. We know that he is king, he is high priest, Kohen Gadol. So we know now that this one who's got this name that he is righteous, or at least living righteously, is king and priest. We've got a great picture of what's coming later. We've got a type. We've got something that's foreshadowing in him and in his character. What we don't know yet, and I will never know for a hundred percent sure until we're in heaven, was he actually Yeshua in human form before he took on human form that we are celebrating at this time of year? Or was he a picture of? Both sides have points to their view. So um, let's go a little more into what who he is, what we do know about him. He, again, was king of Salem. That means king of peace, or you could even say at that time king of rest, the kind of rest that you get when everything's at peace. Not that he was sleeping, but, you know, all is at rest. All was calm, all was good. And that Hebrew word definitely has the full sense of a, of a completion. It's a perfection. It can be a restored, but it's definitely at a state of shalom, at a state of peace. It is identified with Jerusalem. As I would said, we don't know when the name became Yerushalayim versus just Salem, but we know that Salem being identified with Jerusalem definitely is shown in 
archaeology by 1400 BC. That's a little down from where we are right now. Okay, the Exodus is probably about 1445 BC. So we've got a little ways. We're not to Moshe yet. Mm. But, um, but archaeology, we can only go back as far as archaeology goes for our proof. Let me show you another scripture. Let me take you to, um, and I say I need to open a new tab, so I'm going to do that real quick. Um, go with me to Tehillim, to Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2, because I always look for scripture to help me understand scripture. And as I want to know more about Melchizedek, I'm going to look and see, okay, we're only in Bereshit. We're in the beginning. Do we have any other scriptures that tell us about him? What else can we learn from an authoritative source? So as I'm doing that, I'm going to also look at Salem. What do I see about Salem biblically? I, I prefer to find as much evidence as I can in the Word of God and only use outside of the Word of God to help maybe reinforce, like archaeology can prove the Bible to be true. Because, as I said before, they said there couldn't be anybody like Pilate. There would be some proof outside of the Bible if there was. Finally, they found archaeological evidence that proved it. So archaeology is a help, but it's not where we start. We start in the Word of God. In Psalm 76, verse 1 and 2, we will read, We have God is known in Judah. Okay, Elohim is known in Judah in the area of Judah, in the tribe of Judah. His name is great in Israel. God's name was great in Israel. His tabernacle, God's tabernacle, is in Salem. Where was the tabernacle brought? Where was the, te the temple made, built? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in Salem. His dwelling place also is in Zion, or Zion as you say it. And Zion in scripture is interchangeable with either all of Israel or with Jerusalem, one way or the other. So this, these two verses alone are telling me that the God of Judah, great in Israel, his tabernacle was in Salem. I know to be in Jerusalem where the, the, the temple finally is placed to be the dwelling place. And Mount Zion is one of the mountains in Jerusalem. Um, it's where King David's tomb is today, if you've been there. Uh, so this makes it pretty sure to me that Jerusalem and Salem are the same, or at least have come to be synonymous. Um, Jerusalem, again, the whole name means founding or possession of peace. Today, you will hear Jerusalem nicknamed the City of Peace. It gets many names through time, by the way, many names. When the Jebusites had control of the area, this is um, King David's time, Melch David's time, the Jebusites called it Jebus. They are J-E-B-U-S-I-T-E, -E, a Jebusite. Jebus, that's why they were called a Jebusite. I'm an American because I live in America. They called it Jebus, and they were Jebusites because they lived in Jebus. But we know that was Jerusalem because history and the Bible have told us that. Now, I find it very interesting. Righteousness precedes peace. You do not have shalom with God until you're in the righteousness of God. So my king is righteous, brings us peace with God. I can see the progress as time moved on. And if you wonder where I get that, stop with me. Well, actually, you have to go further, so it's not on the way back to Bereshit. Go to Isaiah, Yeshahu, the prophet. We're going to look at Isaiah 32 and verse 17. And that also reminds me, while we're looking at Isaiah 32, 17, that I need to make a cross-reference change so everybody write a note, and you can ask me later, and I'll send it in the text also. But if you have received page 41 of uh, cross-references, you're in the middle of Genesis 15.5. It's the third reference down. You have Job 26, 13, comma 31 and 32. That's what your copy says right now. Your copy should say Job 26.13. Then put a semicolon, and then chapter 38, verses 31 and 32. I missed getting my chapter change in there. So, again, on page 41, cross-references. 
Yes, page 41, the very top. If you don't have it, I've got a copy right here for you. Pay, uh, verse 5, third reference down. You want it to say Job 26, 13, semicolon 38, verses 31 and 32. Okay, because I'll forget, so I know that's out of order. And forgive me for sidetracking you, but I got to do what I, <laughs> what my little brain's going to remember. Okay, I'll probably think to say it again when we get to 15.5. I was hoping to get to it today, and we may or may not. If not, you got a great class coming next week, too, because there's nuggets on both sides of this. So back here, we're looking at Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17. It says, and the work of righteousness will be peace. The service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. We know when we come into the righteousness of God, we have confidence, we have peace. It lasts forever. Our salvation never ends. We don't have to get saved again and again and again and again. We are eternally saved. Romans 5.1. Let's go a little further away from Genesis, but we want Scripture to tell us what Scripture is saying. We're going from the original covenant into the Brit Hadashah. And if you don't think that's Jewish based, stay with me through the next couple lessons. And I don't think you could argue for a moment that what people want to separate and say the old or original is Jewish and the new is Christian. Uh uh. It's one entire book. It goes completely through what you have the foundation of. In the original, you have the completion, the fullness, the full picture of in the Brit Hadashah, and here's one proof because chapter 5, verse 1 of Romans tells us, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a little Jewish flavor there and say through Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. Is Romans now a Gentile Christian book that has nothing to do with the Jewish side, or do we see a total flow? And when it says that we're justified, we're saved by faith, and that brings us peace. When we're saved by faith, we have God's righteousness. There's our peace. Isn't that what Bereshit just taught us by Melchizedek's name? Do you see how we've got a flow and a continual thought and no change? That whole Bible is one book. Don't divide it and give half to the Jews and half to the, quote, Christians. This is a Judeo-Christian book from Bereshit to Revelation. And I'm going to say it again and again and again because I hear the other out there far too much. <laughs> so, yes, I'm on my soapbox. Sorry if you don't like it. I'm going to be there again. I'll just warn you. <laughs> okay. There's so much all over the, the next couple of classes. Back to Genesis. Back to Melchizedek. We're finding out a little bit more. We're going to still see him a little bit more in scripture. But I want us to look at what he did first. And my uh, three kings and my four uh, others, or four and five, just had a meeting. Only it was one dog and one cat, but we about had a, our battle here. That's why you saw my hesitation for a moment. Um, one startled the other. Uh, but thankfully, peace reigned. <laughs> so anyway, back in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 17, we have that Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. Okay, now, remember I told you, Avram and his people, they're warm, they're tired, they need refreshment, they've been on the battle field, you know, they're, they're coming back for the, the reinforcements that they need now, and bread and wine is food and drink, they need it both, they're hungry and they're thirsty, but at the same time, being bread and wine is recognizing a noble um, a person, Melchizedek is recognizing Avram as someone of nobility, someone of wealth, uh, of worth. He's not bringing, okay, I don't want to insult anything, but he's not bringing um, a nickel meal to one who should be given a kingly type meal. He's bringing something of value to him. He's bringing bread and wine, refreshments, but also specific tokens at that time of friendship of hospitality, and that's what he's doing. He's being hospitable to Avram to bring this to them. You know, hey, come, get refreshed here. 
And keep in mind, this one is now being introduced the first time, the first use of the word priest in scripture. So this priest is bringing bread and wine, refreshment, tokens of friendship, of hospitality, worthy of someone who has nobility, and it's represented in a whole picture as brought by the priest. Now the priest we know as we move on in scripture is to represent God to the people. He also represents the people to God. But since this one is coming to Avraham and bringing gifts to Avraham, he's representing his God in bringing those gifts. Now, when we can look and say Melchizedek by his name is foreshadowing one who's going to come, who is going to be king priest, who is going to be the great high priest, who is going to be king, and who is going to be savior and deliverer and all, and we see this being set up, what do we see in the bread and wine? Do we not see what you call communion, what our Jewish people would see comes out of the Passover Seder, which was a picture of what communion represents? We have a picture of the body and the blood. We have a picture of Yeshua in his saving role, that he who is priest of God, representing God, coming into human form, brings us the gift of more than friendship, the gift of more than hospitality, more than refreshes us. He saves our souls. He gave that bread. It's called matzah. He gave it to his Talmudim at Passover, Passover, And said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he picked up the third cup, the cup that comes after supper. Luke tells us that, Matthew 26, Luke 22. Sorry, I'll look it up in Luke, but I think it's 22. You can cross-reference it. Tells us it was the cup after supper. When you know the Passover meal, that cup, because there's four cups, The cup that Yeshua picked up, he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sin, was called the cup of redemption. Do we have the picture of redemption in Melchizedek? Do we have a picture of the Lord who will come and redeem his people? Do we have a picture of the one who brings us peace with God? who is righteous in all his ways. Oh, absolutely. We've got a beautiful picture here. I love it. This is rich. It's not just a name. It's not that he decided to go to the store and, oh, here, I'll pick this up and I'll take this and I'll go give. No, there was meaning behind what he was bringing, who he's representing, and the picture that he is foreshadowing. Because we're only going to get one more chapter and we're going to see another great foreshadowing of our Redeemer also, where we're going to have to just stop and say, wow, wow. We've seen this all the way back from the Garden of Eden, the first time when when man needed a Redeemer and what God promised and what was represented in chapter 3 and verse 15, the foreshadowing, the foreshadowing. It's like layer after layer after layer being added on. We're only in chapter 14, and I can't tell you how many layers we already have (laughs) to identify and see, it is all about Yeshua. It's all about the one who came, who was righteous, is righteous, gives us his righteousness that we can have shalom with our God. That's what we are seeing here. And what a time to do it because this is a time to look at the wonder of it all, how wonderful our Savior is. And that's one of his names also. Yeshaya, Isaiah 9, 6, without going into that whole study, see Shabbat service, um, December, what was the, December 1st? December 1st, whatever last Saturday was, see that whole message there. Every name of God is picturing, is showing, is giving us another layer of who he is, more than just his attributes, more than just his name. These are wows. And here is a wow. And Avram realizes, because he's even being told here, this one who's coming to refresh you, who's bringing this picture of salvation to you, the one who gave you victory, this one is also not just priest. He's priest of God Most High. 
first time that's been used in scripture too. And every time there's a first, there's a significance. <clears throat> in our Hebrew again, El El Yon is saying God, God Most High. That's who he's being told this is. And in that name, the meaning of that name is this is the founder, this is the possessor, this is the creator of heaven and earth. That's why he's God most high, because there is no higher. He is the God who created. He is the God who gave. He is the foundation for our peace, our shalom with him, and we possess it through becoming righteous. How? He does it all. And that's why it's foreshadowed in who Melchizedek, Melchizedek, is representing to us. He absolutely, at least, if not God himself in human form before he took on human form, which is called a Christophany or a Theophany, then if it's not that, then it's made to look like that. And this is where I'm going to go on and tell you. But it's also very interesting as we will move on, we will see this name, God Most High, that even the Gentile, and maybe I should use heathen, um, nations knew the God of Israel by this name. You know, we know the Muslim faith has, um, they call you Yeshua, Jesus, they call me Esau, um, Muhammad's his prophet, Allah. Sorry, brain slip for a moment. We know the Muslim faith, their God is called Allah. Do you know the original meaning of that's moon God? <laughs> okay, who's the God of the moon? All right, just play with that for a while. But the other nations, the heathen, those who Abraham separated himself from, the way they get introduced to the God of Israel, who we know is the one true and living God. There's no other God alive. He is the only God who is alive. Even those who worshiped a God who was alive at a time, like Buddha or someone like that, Buddha's dead, folks. You can go to his grave and see he's dead. You know what you do when you go to Yeshua's grave? <laughs> you read the door. He's not here. He is alive. You see an empty tomb and you shout hallelujah because we serve a living God. We don't serve a God who is alive and dead and that's it. You can't pray to a dead person and get them to answer your prayers, but you can pray to the living God and see him move heaven and earth to answer your prayer requests. What an awesome God. And this is the name that the nations got to know him by because of the testimony that comes through the children of Israel. And not necessarily because they're always doing things right, but because God is who God is. Let me give you a couple quick examples. Look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 3 and verse um, 26. Daniel 3 and verse 26. In fact, I think I may change that reference on you. You have a lot of references written down, and I did want to... Um, just give you one example, and I wrote it down, which one I wanted to use today. Uh, yeah, let me let me tell you. Go ahead and look at Daniel 3, 26, but I'm going to stop at Daniel 4, 24 and 25, because uh, a lot of the verses I gave you in these cross-references repeat the same thing, uh, and I give that to you so you see it's out of more than one mouth here. But Daniel 4, 24 and 25 gives a, a little more of a complete sentence. So I chose to read that one aloud. Any of you who do not have the cross references in front of you, you're going to want to look at um, Daniel 3, 26. Daniel 4, starting with verse 17, the 24 and 25 that I'll read for you, but also 32 and 34. And chapter 5, verses 18 and 21, and then we're going to look at Deuteronomy together also. If that was too fast and you don't have cross-references, get a hold of me. I'll get them to you one way or another. Text, phone call, email, we can work it out. But Daniel chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, we're jumping into the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He's pictured like a tree. He's going to be cut down. We know that for seven seasons, he acts like an animal living out in the wild and until he recognized 
God Most High, he was not brought back into his right mind and put back into position of authority. We're in the middle of that. Daniel's been asked to interpret the dream, and he says in verse 24, This is the interpretation of king. This is the decree of the Most High. So when Daniel's representing his God who's given him the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he says it's God Most High. That's El Elyon, if we looked it in the Hebrew, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you be driven away from mankind, your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field, you will be given grass to eat like cattle, be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it, it bestows it on whomever he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar basically had just crossed the line. I'm equal to God. I'm the one that's done all this. And he lifted himself up on such a high pedestal that God knocked him off that pedestal. Don't ever put someone up on a pedestal because that's all they can do is fall. The only one that belongs on a pedestal is God most high. Nebuchadnezzar had a great fall. He spent the seven seasons, like I said, out living like an animal. And then finally he looked up and said, it's God most high. It's not me. And God brought him back into his right mind and he's reestablished. But notice how Daniel represents to Nebuchadnezzar, this is in, in Babylon, God most high, El Elyon. Now to give you one more quick example, on our way back to Genesis, stop off at Deuteronomy, Davarim, chapter 32. We're about at the end. We're about at the end of Moshe's life. I haven't even gotten to introduce you to him yet. That'll be cool when we get there. But in chapter 32 and verse 8, Moshe is telling them, he's giving history and prophecy in all that he's saying and giving them a charge before he does die and it turns over to Yeshua, Joshua, to be the leader to take them into the promised land. But in verse 8, he says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the numbers of the number of the sons of Israel. He is saying that there's going to be these divisions. There's going to be the land that's given to the, the children of Israel according to their tribes, and we know that. But he's saying also that the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. He gave Egypt, Egypt. He gave the Babylon, Babylon. He gave these areas. And how he's represented to those nations is as El Elyon, the one that we're just now for the first time going back to Genesis 14, seeing being introduced to us. But like I said, step into Avraham's shoes. Either scripture doesn't tell it to us because it can't give us every detail, or Avraham didn't have any question. We're just being told this is who it is, but we don't see him say, where'd you come from and who are you? I think Avram knew who he was and knew who he was representing because Avram is one of faith. But as Melchizedek now is moving in the position of representing God to Avram, most high God, El Elyon to Avram, he says in verse 19, he blessed him. Okay, he put a blessing on Avraham. Blessed be Avram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now, he just met Avram. Avram's coming back. Yay, we won. We got the victory. We did it. Here's our booty. We're bringing back all the people that were taken away. And here's all the loot that we got too, because they came back with great wealth. Read it earlier. We talked about it before. But Melchizedek said it accurately. Avraham, you didn't do this. God gave you the ability to do this. God's the one who gets the victory. God is the one who won that war. We hear the battle cry of the Maccabees at this time of year because we celebrate Hanukkah when the Maccabean revolt beat back the Syrian army. You had a few guerrilla tactic warfare smarties <laughs> that had just a few thousand people up against 10,000 plus in the Syrian army who had all the weapons of war and these people had nothing to speak of. They did, in today's vernacular, it would be like a tank 
against a jalopy, okay? There was nothing equal. The Syrian army was beat back out of Yerushalayim. Israel is able to recapture her capital, able to get back her temple, able to put into practice worship of the Most High God again. And that's the celebration of Hanukkah without going into a little more depth of meaning for it. And come see us at one of our Hanukkah celebrations real soon. We'll give you the whole history. But the, the battle cry of the Maccabees was, Who is like unto thee, O God Most High? That's what they put up. Their banner that they raised up didn't say, Maccabee in revolt. Mm -hmm. The banner said, in the name of God, we will get victory. And God honored them and gave them the victory. Avram, in the name of God, got this victory. And Melchizedek is introducing to us, this is God most high. This is El Elyon. This is the name that's going to go to the nations because Israel is going to be the priest that represents God to the nations. And we're going to hear many a times that they had, they didn't have newspapers, they didn't have Pony Express, they didn't have CNN, they didn't have, you know, Film at 11. <laughs> but somehow the word got around because you will hear the enemies, Rahab, Rahab, Jericho, she knows those walls are coming down. She knows the children of Israel are going to be victorious. She says, we've heard about your God. We've heard about your victories. If I'd gone further in Deuteronomy chapter 32, even there, um, and it's related into the Psalms, and I don't remember the Psalm right now because I didn't know my mind was going to go here, but I can get you verses later where God is saying, I would have even wiped out the children of Israel for their rebellion and their, their disobedience, but I didn't do that because the enemies would say, ha, we got victory over their God. And he wasn't about to let that happen because he's going to keep his name pure and worthy of what he is. He is God most high. So he didn't even let the children of Israel be wiped out when they deserved it because of his name. That's this name that Melchizedek is representing. And through that name, blessing comes on Avraham, the one who possesses it all. He didn't need Avraham's victory. He didn't need Avram's booty. He is the one that's bringing to Avram bread and wine, refreshment. But look at the greater picture. I'm going to bring you the greater refreshment, the greater victory, the greater redemption of your soul. All of this coming out of this name. He is the one who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Wow. What a picture we've got. And I get all excited over typology in Scripture, and that's what it's called. Let me give you the spiritual meaning and typology of Melchizedek now to, to, to solidify everything I've said. And then we're going to look at the same time at these other references in Scripture that talk about Melchizedek so that we get the full understanding. In other words, if I want to know who Daniel was, I'm going to go look at Daniel's Scriptures. But... I can't just look at Daniel. I know that Yeshua spoke about Daniel and Matthew. So I'm going to go look at what Yeshua said about Daniel because that's going to help me know about Daniel. And I know others talked about him also. I'm going to go look at the other places. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to also look at what else was said about Melchizedek. Um, first point that we'll bring out to bring this complete picture is that, yes, we are speaking of the priesthood of Yeshua. We're not just speaking of any priest, but as Melchizedek is representing El Elyon, we are seeing the priesthood that Yeshua Jesus, who will also be king and priest, is being represented in. And that priesthood that we're seeing is superior to Aharon's, to Aaron's. Aaron's a line that the priests come through, but we're going to find there is a greater line than Aaron's. And we're going to see that as scripture will tell us that. So we'll get that in a moment. First of all, the one way that I can tell you quickly that it's superior is this priesthood is eternal. Now, if you ask me anything about the priests in scripture, all the way through in our original covenant, what happens with every one of those priests? They die. You got it right. I hate that word. I hate dealing with death. I can't wait till we're out of this world and we never deal with death again. But this is the reality. You had a priest. You had a high priest. You had him for a time. The high priest in that started called Aaron, he was the first. He died. Someone had to take it over for him. 
That one died. I can't tell you how many priests there were by the time we got down to the day that Yeshua walked on earth. But we're talking about a priesthood that does not experience death. It's eternal. Let me show you. Go with me to Tehillim Psalm 110. And we're going to look at verses 1 and, and verse 4. This is a Messianic Psalm, which means it speaks of Messiah. It's recognized as a Messianic Psalm. And I don't know any way around it because of the very first verse that tells us that. <laughs> the Lord says to my Lord. Now, in our English, that looks the same. But if you've got one of those Bibles that gives you little hints and little helps, you have the capital L-O-R-D says to my Lord, capital L-O-R-D. What you have is you have two different words. You have, um, okay, sorry. You have Yehovah said to Adonai. Okay, you have the Lord Yehovah said to my Adonai, my Lord, sit at my right hand. Okay, before, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, so... The Lord speaking to this Lord and saying, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. All your enemies are going to be under your feet. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn, and this is Jehovah, has sworn and will not change his mind. You, the other, the Adonai Lord, are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Here's our name. So we're told Melchizedek is a priest forever. Okay, his priesthood is forever. We don't see it end. We know that's accurate because he's representing Yeshua as priest, and we know Yeshua's work is eternal. It never ends. So right here, we can see that from the Hebrew and tying it together. Read the whole psalm later. It's a wonderful, as I said, Messianic psalm, speaking of the power of the coming Messiah. The one who, and by the way, Jehovah is like God the Father, and Adonai is more representing the, the Son. Um, one means, and I, I've got this, it, it, will, it will come up right here. Um, one is meaning, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. The second one is meaning uh, Master, Lord, one who is, uh, you know, the authority, the other, it'll come up in just a moment. I'll have it. Jehovah is um, the strong one, I think, if I'm remembering right, but all of a sudden I'm drawing a blank. I am so sorry. My mind's spinning too fast. I'll have it for you as soon as I find it in my notes, because this is, this is Hebrew 101, and I better know 101. <laughs> I better have my beginning, my ABCs. It'll come back in a moment. I'm just stressing. Um, let me take you to Hebrews 5 while I let my mind calm down and come up with what I want it to say. Hebrews 5 verses 6 through 8. We're going to look at that also because it talks to us again about Melchizedek. So this is where we're getting our whole picture. And this says in Hebrews 5, verse 6, just as he says in another passage, so he's quoting where it's been quoted before, and it comes out of what we just read, where it was quoted before with Psalm or Tehillim 110. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So now it's been quoted by the psalmist, and it's also been quoted by the one who's the author of the book of Hebrews. Now, I can tell you the ones who wrote the Psalms are long dead by the time the one comes along who writes the book of Hebrews. So you've got, again, death in our picture. You've got different people, but you've got different people, different times saying the same thing. The Bible never disagrees with itself. So out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, Melchizedek is a picture of a eternal priesthood. It goes on forever. And it says here also, in the days of his flesh, the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Okay, do you remember Yeshua in the garden the night before he went to the, to the cross? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he said in his flesh that he always came to do the will of his father. So that's all he was doing was the will of his father. But he's crying out in his human flesh the agony of knowing what he was going to go through the next day. A lot of people put that to the suffering, the physical suffering. 
And I will not take away from that. That's a horror I can't watch. I couldn't make it through the movie that did show it. It, it. I don't know how he humanly made it all the way to the cross without it being his death, except that he was God and Abel. But I think the greater agony was holy God. And it just said here he was hurt because of his piety. He was hurt because of his righteousness. God heard his cry because of who he was. He was God crying out. Hard for us to fathom and understand, but the agony, the greater agony was holy God who was going to take on sin. He was going to become the sin sacrifice. He was going to have that moment when God was going to turn his back because God could not look on sin. And in that moment, he was going to cry out, Eli, Eli, lama tzabachni, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's something you should never have come out of your lips because it's a bold-faced lie for you to say it. Your God never forsakes you. And he promises that in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never know, not anyway, uh-uh, no how. Five different ways, no, never forsake you or abandon you. Here, Yeshua is saying, there's going to be this moment when even though I am holy and pure and perfect and righteous, I'm going to take on sin in the form of being the sin sacrifice that takes away the penalty of sin, takes away death, so that we may physically experience death, but our spirit gets eternal life with the Lord in heaven because he paid the penalty. He put his blood on the altar. Sinless, perfect blood for our salvation. And hallelujah, Beatrice, mm. I'm with you. Clap your hands. Hallelujah. Say it and show it because I saw it pour out of you a second ago. She was clapping her hands at what I was saying. And that's what's being represented here. In his human form, he cried out. He was hurt because of his piety. But verse 8, although he was a son, we know he was born. He grew up as a child. But notice the son is capitalized because the son was given. He still, in that human form, learned obedience from the things which he suffered. He didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth and an easy life. He came and he suffered in this life and the greatest suffering in that physical and that spiritual sense that I just spoke about so that he could bring us salvation. Wow. That's what Melchizedek is representing to us. That's a priest forever because he didn't stay dead. Hallelujah. Remember what I said? We go to his tomb in Israel and we see an empty tomb. We're not there looking for bones or what, what the bones turn into, the ashes. We're not there looking for a souvenir or, or something to show us that he was there. We see an empty tomb because he's gone. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. He took the penalty. He's priest forever. His priesthood continues on and never is replaced by another. Dora. Okay, so when he's, I mean, anytime we, we run across Adonai, is that somebody, or the father's talking to the son? Or is that the son being described? It's usually describing who you would say Lord Jesus. Uh -huh. And Jehovah is usually describing who you'd say God the Father. But I say usually because you will see an intertwining and a crossing. Go to Revelation 1 and you will see which one's it talking about. And about the time you decide it's talking about Jehovah God the Father, you can say, oh, no, wait a minute. This is a description of the Son. And about the time you decide, okay, it's the Son, you can say, but no, wait a minute. That's God the Father. So they're that interchangeable. But, but as a kind of like loose rule, usually especially when they're in the same context together, then yes, Jehovah is representing God the Father and Lord is representing, or Adonai is representing Lord, who is master, who is Lord, not just, you know, down here. We're down here. He's still up here okay. because he's equal to, to the Father. So is the Father telling him that he's going to be priest forever? Yes. And the Father was telling him back in Psalm 110, sit at my right hand. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. And we know when Yeshua comes back and wipes them out with the sword of his mouth, all his enemies are under his footstool. But it's at the, the in essence, God saying, go. Now is the time, go. The victory is yours. Mm -hmm. But they're together carrying it out. You know, one doesn't do it without the other. The other doesn't do it without the one. So, you know, who created, God or Yeshua? And we saw very clearly they both did, didn't they? 
we saw it very clearly in our Hebrew and in all those verses we looked at before we long before we got out of creation, we saw they are inseparable. And do we fully understand? No. No, honestly, we don't. But I don't understand how creation came out of nothing and how God was there before that. <laughs> how do you get back that far? And I honestly don't understand forever. I understand finity. I don't understand infinity. I take it by faith because my God has proven to him to me in every other way that is understandable on my level. And if I could fully understand God on my level, then wouldn't that make me equal to God? And oi, gewalt. <laughs> Uh, I, I, what, how can I say my, my mind wants to say God help us all if that's God but you can't even say that no my God has to be greater and better than the greatest and best among human flesh and he is and he proves it every time so even Yeshua in the flesh is divinely God at the same time 100% human but 100% God at the very same time and it took God to be able to do that but when you want to say well that's impossible then I'm going to say good now you're beginning to get who God is and God tells us Matthew 19 26 with man it's impossible but with God all things are possible. And when someone says to you, well, how can a virgin conceive? How could God put himself into the form of an infant in the womb of a woman to be born? And I will say, how could God create this entire universe out of nothing? When we get there next week, because obviously I'm too talky today, we're not going to get there. So what I put in the text to you is, is going to be part two next week. We're going to look at the stars God put the stars in space, and he not only flung them out, it's called finger work, but he named those stars, and he knows the names of them all, and he put them all where they belong, and that's just talking about us in our Milky Way. Do you know how many more universes there are? How many more billions of stars and I'll call them whatnots because I don't know what they are, the black holes and all the rest that's out there. If God could create all of that in an orderly fashion and keep it, then what is it to put seed in the womb of a virgin? He conceived the he he made the woman. He made her womb. <laughs> How can we stop short and say, oh, God can't do that? Really? If that's your problem? And how perfectly it works. <laughs> and how perfectly, yes. And if that's your problem, I'm going to say to you, your God is too small. My God is bigger. My God is better. My God is El Elyon. My God is the most high God. My God tells the waves where to stop. My God tells the Red Sea part, and it does. My God says, Shalom, Alechem to the waves, peace, be still. It's just said Shalom, not Alechem, that's under you. He said to the waves, Shalom, and they stopped. My God walked on the water. He defied gravity. My God raised the dead. He gave life to those who were lifeless initially and secondly in resurrection. He healed the sick. The lepers were cleansed. Nobody got cleansed from leprosy except by a miracle. Miriam did by the miracle of God. Yeshua did by the miracle. Not he personally. He healed personally by being the miracle that was being performed by God through Yeshua. That's my God. Now, my next question for you. What are you worrying about? Where's your anxiety level? What can't God do in your life that you need to worry? And where? Has he ever proven unfaithful? That's why shame on us. Why God says without faith it's impossible to please him. Because if we can't say, I trust you, Abba. I trust you, Daddy. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, El Elyon. If we can't say that, our God is too small and it's all over. But I, he's never proven untruthful untrustworthy. Never, 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 never. I'm way off. Let me keep moving. So Melchizedek here, Melchizedek, he says here that he's eternal, that he had a flesh side we see, cries out in that, but he stayed in it. He did God's will. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2. 
Okay, let's move on in Hebrews to chapter 6 and verse 20. So just go right over to the next chapter and drop down to verse 20, and we'll learn another um, exciting order. Verse 20 says, Where Yeshua has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So he's not a priest after the order of Aharon, an order that dies, an order that needs replacement, an order of humanity. He's after the order of the high priest forever. And in that, he's become the forerunner for us. You know where he ran ahead? Into heaven and opened it up so that we get to follow him. That's what the earlier verses say. Read them and you will see that he is the, the forerunner for us into the heavenlies. Wow. Now go to chapter 7. We're staying long on Melchizedek because he is worthy of our study. This is wow. So chapter 7, Hebrews, verse 1. And by the way, Hebrews was written to the Messianic Jews. It was reading to Jews who, written to Jews who believed in Messiah but they're questioning everything because they've been taught they have to be in the commonwealth of Israel to receive God's promises and to be in line so that they'll be where they're supposed to be when Messiah returns. And they're, got, they're getting booted out of the temple now. The temple ignored them for a while, but now the temple is saying, eh, uh-uh, you're teaching us different stuff we don't like. You're, you've gone too far. You ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? And Tevi is asked, you know, how far can I bend with each daughter? He bends a little farther. But with the last one, he says, I can't bend that far. I'll break. Well, that's how they felt. You messianic believers who are telling us that we don't have to keep the law for salvation. We don't have to make these sacrifices. We don't like that. So they booted them out. And now that they're out there, because they didn't have all the scriptures to run to, to read. They didn't have all the studies that we've had the privy of. They're saying to themselves, did we make a mistake? We're on the outside of Israel now. What if Messiah comes back and we're outside of that? And it was giving them a cause for concern. Their boat was rocking a little. And I believe it to be Shaul Paul, but whoever you want to think, the author that God gave this position to steps in. Had to be one who knew the background well. How much better could you be than Paul, who was sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who, who was raised? That was a high honor. He was one of the most revered rabbi sages of the time. Shaul Paul was trained by him had the background, said, I am the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I am a zealot. I have learned all of this. I've been at the feet. I've studied the scriptures. And that's why he would be the fitting author to present to our Jewish people from a Jewish perspective. It would be like me trying to go talk to the Muslims without any Muslim background. I'm not going to get very far. But one who has studied and knows what the Muslims believe and knows where to show them our scriptures would know how to relate to them. And this one comes in and he's going to give us the whole of Melchizedek here in chapter 7. And this whole book is all about better. One key word for the book of Hebrews is better. Better sacrifice, better priesthood. That's where we are right now. Better everything that, that's being presented because we get the better, the completion in Yeshua. So here we go. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, everything we learned in Genesis, in Bereshit. And again, you want to separate this and say this is the Christian side? Then what are they doing taking the scriptures from Genesis? Because they just quoted what Genesis tells us. It's because it's one book, and it's for both. It is for those who complete their faith in Yeshua Jesus. Priest of the Most High God, who met Avraham as, his, as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Hmm, where would I find that? Where is that recorded? And if all of you can't right now say, Genesis 14, <laughs> then I'm a rotten teacher, <laughs> okay? This tells us, this is what it's talking about, is Bereshit chapter 14, verse 2. To whom also Avraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. What did I just read? Avraham honored this one who's called, first of all, he's called king of righteousness, and then he's called king of peace. And remember, we looked and we said we have to have righteousness with God before we can have peace. Remember, we saw that in Romans, 
We saw that in the Brit Ahadashah, which is building on the original covenant. We see this fullness coming all the way through. And what did Avram do to honor him? Because we didn't read this in verse in chapter 14, or at least not yet. What did he do? He gave him a tenth part of the spoils. The spoils is, this is the booty, what he came back from in war. If you came back with a hundred gold bricks, he gave, if he did, then he gave 10 gold bricks to Melchizedek. Whatever it was, he gave a tenth of. What do we know about the tenth that we learn as we move down and get into the law? Is that not the tithe that is given to the Lord? The, the Lord gives us, and we're to give him a tenth back. But I'm going to take you prior to the law. Before it came into effect, you have Yaakov, Jacob. Jacob, if you've been with me in the parshas, and even this as recent as this last Saturday, our study, we see that he, at a time when his boat was rocking, God opened up heaven to him, stood at the top of heaven, made promises to him, and showed him the bridge between heaven and earth is the ladder that was a picture of Yeshua, the same way Melchizedek is a picture of Yeshua. Wow, it's all coming together. I'm so excited because Scripture just keeps unveiling Scripture to us all the more and all the depth. And Yaakov said, God, if you'll bless me in this way, and if you'll bring me back like you say, I will give you a tenth of all I get. And Yaakov goes off for 20 years, takes him 20 years to come back, and he comes back with four wives with a ton of babies, not a ton, but, you know, 12, the 12 tribes. He comes back with flocks, with great wealth. He makes his altar. He gives his tithe to the Lord. God blessed him, and he blessed God back by giving back to God. We have the same thing here. Avram had, where did Jacob learn that? You think he learned that? By hearing what Avraham did, when Avraham stood before a representation of the Lord and gave to the Lord in that way, yeah, I think that's where he could have learned it. He also saw it or heard it from Noah, who also gave in the same way, but many examples. So now we know this king of righteousness, this king of peace has received tithes. That's a huge clue when you're looking at who this is, okay? We're going to go a little further, though. Verse 3 tells us, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Melchizedek jumped into our picture. Remember how much genealogy we've had? We can go back and map everybody back to Adam, everybody back to Noah. We've got the family lines. We have the line of Shem. We have the line of, of um, Seth. Those are the two godly lines. We've got all these, and he begat, and he begat, and he begat. Remember that one chapter that it was, he had, he had these children, and he lived this amount of years. And we don't get anything else about their life sometimes. Just they had so many children, and that's how long he lived. Here, all of a sudden, we've got one who is bigger than life, who is a heavyweight. He's not a nobody. But we don't have a word about who his mommy and daddy were and who his grandparents were. We know he's not of the line that we know about. So where did he come from? What is his genealogy? When was he born? Hey, folks, when did Melchizedek die? There's nothing recorded. Why? What's the point? And I finished the verse. But made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Perpetually is continually. So by having nothing told us of a beginning and an end, he is a picture of a perpetual, a continual priesthood. Until we're told Melchizedek died, he didn't die. He lived on and on and on. In the picture he is of Yeshua, he absolutely is showing the eternality of Yeshua as our high priest forever. We don't need another high priest. We don't need the temple to be rebuilt. We don't need the sacrifices to be started again. It's all been done. The Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. It's all been done. He was the sacrifice. He was the priest. He is the king. He is the judge. He is El Elyon. He is the God Most High. That's who's being represented here. And we're getting a lot about him. So let's go on. Verse 4. Now observe how great this man was. 
to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. See, it's not just me telling you this. I got this out of the word of God. I just read before I told you guys. And those indeed, verse 6, of the sons of Levi, Levi, who received the priest's office half commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. So, tribe of Levi, Levi, whom gives us our priests, the priests are allowed to receive a tenth of your spoils, what God's blessed you with, you are to bring to the priests, but that priest, those priests that you're bringing them to, they're your brethren. They descended from Abraham. Remember, Abraham had a son. His son had a son. His son had 12 sons. Levi is one of them. The other 11 are their bro his brothers. They were all related. By the time you go down another generation, they're all cousins. That's what we're seeing. But let's keep reading. But the one whose genealogy is not traced, so the one, Melchizedek, who we don't have the genealogy on, from them collected a tenth from Avraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Okay, so this one, even though he's not of the tribe of Levi, he still accepted as priest the tenth. He had that right, and he did accept it from Avraham. And Avraham, oh, hey, folks, this is saying he's no small potatoes. This one is the one who had the promises from God. Remember Genesis 12? God promised to bless him, to make him a great nation, to bring to him offspring. And we're going to see in verse 15 the clue of how important that offspring was because it's going to talk about one seed that would come from Abraham. And that just happens to be Yeshua, who Melchi Zedek is just happening to be a picture of for us. Wow. Do you get it? Do you get excited? I hope you do. I do, <laughs> obviously. Okay, so Melchi Zedek was able to bless Avraham. The blessee is greater than the, no, I'm sorry, the blessor is greater than the blessee. So Melchizedek is lifted higher up than Avraham. Avraham deserved certain things. He was the one of promise. God had him raised up, but he bowed his head to this one who was higher and gave his ties to that one. Verse 7, but without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. I just explained that. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. Your priestly levies, they receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. We don't have Melchizedek's death, so we can't say he died. So here's the higher, here's the greater. And so to speak, verse 9, the, through Avraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. What does that mean? We're told that we are to picture ourselves, uh, the Jewish people, as being in the loins of Moshe when he stood at Mount Sinai. We were his offspring that would come, and we're to picture ourselves as if we were standing there that day and making commitment to the God who revealed himself through his commandments at Mount Sinai. In the same way, we're in the loins of Avraham, and we are to picture ourselves as being there with Avraham, giving a tenth to bless this one who is blessing Avraham. That's what it's saying to us, that, that it's as if we met Melchizedek and offered our, our what we have, a tenth of what we have to him also. Um, I think that's verse 10, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Levi wasn't born yet. He was still in the, the loins of Abraham. He would come, but it, he's pictured as if he gave. And that's all the way down. After Levi, it comes all the way down to us. So I, as a Jewish person, am to picture myself right there with Abraham, giving my tithes to Melchizedek, who is pictured as having no beginning and no end. That is the eternality. That is a huge picture, and that is a beautiful picture of my God, El Elyon, worthy of my praise, worthy of my honoring, worthy of my giving tithes to. And I will tell you honestly, I don't go by the 10% rule. I go by that's a minimum. If God blesses you greatly, give greatly. You can never outgive God anyway, but all God required was you to show that heart 
by giving in that way. And when we get into the Brit Hadashah, God says, don't give if you can't give happily. If you're giving it because you have to, it's worthless. But if you're giving because you want to give to God, that's what he wants you to give. And I will tell you honestly, some people think, oh, I'm doing God a favor. I'm a millionaire, and I wrote out my, my little check for what? You know, 1000 or whatever it equals. And then you've got one who only has $1,000 and has such a heart for God and is writing out that check to God and maybe is sacrificing something that they really needed, but they said, I'm, I'm going to put that on hold and I'm going to give to God. That's the greater gift than the huge. You all understand what I'm saying. It's a giving of the heart. And if you're in a position where you cannot to give, if you think God's going to judge you and say, no, I'm not going to bless you, realize God says that you're to give as God has prospered you and realize that God is bringing you into a place. He may be asking you, are you going to trust me in your finances? Are you going to give to me when it is tight? Or are you going to be afraid and I got to save this for a rainy day? God wants you to give joyfully, but because you are giving to him, saying, Lord, you have blessed me. I want to give you this, and I want to give you more. And if you can give more, I'm going to encourage you. <laughs> give and look what God does for you. And don't give because of that, but give because of the heart. Yes. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, test them. Yes, it is. And it's very strange how they will pull that out of a Jewish book under Jewish law and apply it to the church, but not take the curses and the, if you do, don't do this, this will happen. <laughs> but God does say, and he said it to the, the priests and to the priesthood, which was corrupt at the time. So again, it's not because everything's done right. You may give and say, but they're not handling the money the way I think they should, God. That's none of your business. When you give God your tithe, let go and let God. He'll deal with whoever does or doesn't do what's right. That's, mm -hmm. that's his part, not yours. But God did say, you know, prove me, prove me. I'll open up all of heaven and pour out a blessing on you so great you can't contain it all. And I will tell you, those blessings will come in more ways than you can imagine, too. Yeah. So, what a picture. Okay, now, we know that he's a type of Messiah. We've said that very clearly. No genealogy appears to be internal, sorry, eternal, without beginning and without end. We know that he's a king and a priest, a highly unusual, only other time we find it in scripture is referring to Yeshua. Let me show you. That's Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 6 and verse 13. So that's where we want to go now to Zechariah, chapter 6 and verse 13. I actually, whoops, I actually like 12 and 13 because the name of the ministry I'm involved in comes out of this. Samach the branch in verse 12, but we'll focus on 13. <laughs> and verse 13 says, yes, it is he. Well, maybe I do need to give you 12. 12 says, then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, thus says Adonai Savaot, Lord of hosts is heavenly hosts and a host of others also, armies, people. Behold, pay attention, don't miss this. Behold, a man whose name is Branch. Samach. So when you hear me talk about the ministry of Samach, this is where the name comes from. And in fact, when Pastor Gail and I were trying to name this new little baby, we were throwing out different ideas, and I can still picture it. I can see where he was, and I can see where I was. And at the same time that I was bringing to him saying, what do you think about the name Samach? He was saying to me, before I could say what it meant, I'm hearing him say in English, and we're talking at the same time, how do you say the branch in Hebrew? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Samach, I just said it. And we both knew in a heartbeat, the witness of the spirit within both of us, that was to be the name. And we, the full name is Samach uh, Global Ministries because the ministry is to go to the Jew first, but also to the Gentiles. So there's the name. It comes from the branch. This one, behold, a man whose name is a branch for he will branch out. He will sprout out from where he is. He will build the temple of the Lord. Notice not the temple of man. He's going to build the eternal temple of the Lord that we see pictured in Hezekiel chapters 40 through 48. And it is wow compared to Melch David's plans that Shlomo Solomon built. 
the temple that we know at Herod's time that he refurbished and made great, those are nothing compared to the one that Yeshua is going to make and fill with his presence. That's the glory of it. That's why it's a wow. Anyway, this one who is going to um, branch out, build the temple of the Lord, verse 13 now. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Here's king. He's going to rule as king. He's going to sit on the throne. We know he sits on David's throne. He promised David he'd put he'd sit on his throne and he does. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne. So he's not just king sitting on the throne. He is priest sitting on the throne. He is king and priest and the council of peace. What follows righteousness? Peace. The council of his of peace will be between the two offices. Because when you have a righteous king and a righteous priest in one who is ruling, you have shalom. I was going to say in the home, but it's far more than in the home. It, it will be worldwide at that time. But I like shalom in the home too. So this is showing us Yeshua is going to be fully king, fully priest. Kohen Gadol, high priest, not just any priest, the high priest. Hebrews tells us that, many other places. So we now know that that's why Melchizedek is king and priest in Bereshit. Because he's not in the genealogical line of Aaron, the ones who give us the Levites, the ones who give us those priests. He's after a different order, a higher order, an eternal order, no beginning, no end. It pictures for us our Messiah. So that brings us to our third point. He is a man. We see him pictured as a man. But is he a man in as a theophany, as a God in human form, or a Christophany, Christ in human form, or is he just man? That's the big question. Was he really Yeshua personified in reality before he is born in human flesh, or was he simply a man made to look like Yeshua? Okay, let me take you back to Hebrews real quick. I should have told you to keep your thumb in there, but I forgot to. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, where we talked about that genealogy, it says, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. Now, we're into our Greek, okay? We're not into our Hebrew, we're into our Greek. The Greek word can be translated, this can be translated, he, she, or it is demonstrative pronoun. So basically it's saying, this one was like the Son of God, okay? Now, if he was made like the Son of God, then he's not the Son of God. He's made like him. Um, there's another word in our Greek, um, comes from two words put together, and it's used here when it said made like the Son of God. This is the word that is used here. It's apa and homoyo. I forget exactly how to say it in my Greek. I may be slaughtering that one. But it means to assimilate, to make like, to assimilate closely. It is a perfect active participle, which means it causes, there's, there's an action here, it causes a model to pass off in, in an image or a shape like it to express itself in a copy, a facsimile, a rendered similar. When I hear all of that, all those different ways it can be, then that says to me then Melchizedek is a picture of. He, we don't know about his beginning and end so that he can be a picture of. We're told these different things about him. He's in this position to make him a picture of, but he was not actually a, a theophany or Christophany. If that is the accurate translation from the Greek, he was made like. It seems to me very likely that that is what was meant. But at the same time, because we don't have any of this beginning and end, and we're told to look at it as if he does continue on forever. You've heard me say it. You heard me say many things building up to this verse that give you the idea he was a theophany or Christophany. That's why we can't really 
say dogmatically it's this way or it's this way. And I will leave that up to you to decide. The very fact that he received these tithes, and they were earthly tithes, they were, you know, the out of the booty, I will ask the question, it'll be an argument out of silence, but if he was God, if he was Christ, Messiah, in in um, this, this form, what would he do with those tithes? Because he's not going to be living on this earth benefiting from those tithes as the tithes that come in to the priests were to benefit them in their lives. In other words, what did he do with it when he, quote, disappeared Where'd they go? If he was a real human, he could have absorbed and used the tithes, you know, as the blessing he received because Avraham tithes to him. But again, when he tithes him, he represented in Abraham's mind, this one is greater than I. Again, the, even the priests that they were giving, they were representing that priestly role is higher than our role. So it's why I, I lean toward that he really was made like, but was not. But I, at the same time, look at the all the ways he was not and say, I can't shut down any of my fellow brethren who want to say, no, he was a theophany, he was a Christophany. I'll say, you know what? You absolutely could be right. I, I really can't 100% get into either camp. I'm just a little more in the he was made like because of all of that Greek meaning. But take it to the Lord and ask the Lord which way he wants you to think and be content with that because uh, there's no reason to argue over it. It doesn't matter. He either was a picture of or he was. But either way, it's, wow, what a picture. I will tell you, in Jewish tradition, they want to say that Melchizedek was Shem. Shem, remember the lives overlap, we tend to... We think Shem was a long time ago, but he wasn't. Their lives overlapped for a period of time. Um, different sources will give me different time. Some say that, that there was like a 35-year override between their two lives, and some say it was more, and some say it was less. I want to pull out my timeline and really study it and see if I can get there. But as I tried to wrap my mind around in the time I had, they, I can just tell you their, their lives did intersect. But if it was Shem, it, it just I, it does not fit at all. We've got Shem's genealogy. We've got Shem's death. So I can't believe that Melchizedek was Shem. It, it just that falls apart for me right there. And I want to say to my rabbis in respect, how can you say it's Shem when you have Shem's facts and you don't have this one's facts? I think the only reason why they say it is Shem was revered. He was passing down the godly line, and because he was still alive, they thought he was the most revered spiritual person. They thought he would be a priest, and so they thought he fit the role. But I think that's stretching it. And when I see also that bread and wine are memorials of Messiah's sacrifice, that's showing the priestly work of Messiah, his death and resurrection. I see that as a picture. There is a faith quote that believes that that body, that, that bread, I'm sorry, and that wine actually become the body and the blood over and over and over and over again. I don't. I believe that it's a picture of. In the same way, I'm believing this is a picture of. In the same way that I said, when we look at our Pesach and we see the matzah and the wine, we're seeing a picture of. And there are many other times in Scripture we see pictures of. They weren't the actuality, but they were the pictures of. Oh, my word, I see the time. Shalom, <laughs> Beatrice. I know you've got to go. Let me tie up the thought real quick, and she can get it on the end later, but I'm so sorry. And obviously, we're not getting into part two, so come back next week for another great lesson because it's the Word of God, and I'm so excited. But let's go back real quick and tie it up. Genesis 19, I'm sorry, 14. Genesis 14, verse 19. We've got, I already read that, that he blessed Avram, possessor of heaven and earth, so what am I wanting to bring out? Um, I've already brought out that the title goes beyond all national relationships. This is God, God, God the Most High. 
the possessor of heaven and earth. He is the one who has the right to give Avraham and to give his seed the land of Canaan, the blessings he's promised to Avraham. He has a right to give them because he owns it all. He possesses it all. He created it all. Um, and also notice that the king priest that we read about in Zechariah 6.13, he will bless Avram and his seed in the millennium after Israel saved from her enemies. When those who go into the millennium, when Messiah sits on the throne, those there, in essence, we've got a picture of that here. We've got a picture of Israel's victory because we have it in Avram. Avram had victory brought his ties to king priest. Israel will come into the millennium, give her ties to king priest who is Messiah. So the king priest in Zechariah is a picture of the one who will bless Israel when she comes into the millennial time where there will be a thousand years of peace when, when Yeshua rules on the earthly throne out of Jerusalem. Um, I wanna see, I need to do 20 and we can stop there. Be blessed be, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Avram did not accomplish this victory. It was God given. God gave it to him. He gave him. That's what it says. Avram gave to Melchizedek for God's glory. God. Avram was saying, "Yes, God got the victory. He. I give him that tenth, showing that 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 is." my you know way of honoring the god who gave the victory and the tenth part i think i already presented out it was the general custom even of that time before the law um, that would be to a divine one a, a king a ruler a leader in this case the divine priesthood of melchizedek received those ties the same way jacob promised on his way to haran when i come you know you take me out you bring me back i will give to you so overall all of it avram is acknowledging the victory came from god's doing and it shows that he saw melchizedek melchizedek as representing god and that's why he gave his tithes to him because this was avram's way of giving to god um, then we'll read next week. Well, I, I guess I didn't finish the last phrase. He gave him a tenth of all. Um, next week we'll pick up. It's just kind of a loose end, but it'll give us a chance to tie up in a nutshell in one paragraph what we spent this whole time teaching today. Uh, but we will see what happened with the other, the 90% that didn't go to Melchizedek. We'll see what Avram does with that. And uh, we will see how he respects that name, El Elyon, God Most High. He's, he's going to show that by an action that he does in the next couple of verses. Um, if it wasn't 347, I'd give it to you, but I think our minds are probably have, have absorbed all we can absorb, and it is late. So we'll just come back and, and put a nice bow on our gift that we got today in studying and seeing, especially in depth, Melchizedek, and I hope it's blessed you as much as it does me to see such a picture of my God. It just, it, it puts a little more color into the picture, helps me understand God who is the creator of the universe who I can't even fathom. I can begin to understand a little bit when I can put it into a perspective that humanly I can relate to. And I believe that's what it's supposed to be doing. So. Um, I will close with the fact, that, are there any questions, any comments, any, you know, you're free to give your opinion. If there's, if you just want the open discussion, I'll close in prayer real quick, but anything that needs to be on video, you know, something I didn't make clear, something you want to add in. Okay, then let me close in prayer.